good morning, and uh, thank you, El uh, Melvin. The, um, I thought for today, um, the, the world is generally obsessed with talking about imbalances. And a theme that I'd like to um, uh, share with you today is about the rebalancing of, of Asia. And increasingly, Asia is getting more balance. Um, but it may not be to, to what uh, Gerard would like to hear, because my first theme is from the financial centers of Hong Kong and Singapore to continental economies like China, India, and Indonesia. And um, as Asian investors, um, when we invest, we typically think first of capital gains. Income is secondary as, uh, in, in, uh, um, uh, in equity investing. And um, what we are seeing as well is a return or a respect for income in terms of its share of generation of the uh, returns on one's portfolio. And lastly, um, in, in our business, it's, um, it's more common to talk about products. In, in fact, there is a huge proliferation of products, and there are more mutual funds than there are stocks, for example, uh, in the world. And um, the, um, the real challenge, really, over there is in, uh, is in solutions. So um, going on to my first point, in fact, if you think back um, 10, 20 years back, and when we spoke about Asia, it was really about the, what were called the Asian tigers or the Asian dragons. And the uh, continental economies of China and India had a very small share in market capitalization. Um, I think one of the most significant developments in the past decade is the rise of continental economies in the share of our uh, market composition and in particular in the rise of China. And it is very significant that we now have an Asia that is anchored by continental economies. And uh, because Gerard would remember that in the old days when we talk about Asia, basically it's property, banks, um, perhaps utilities and tech, and that's it. Um, but we are now a much richer nation, uh, a region so if you'd like, this is a, um, a sort of like a Michael Porter's um, a circle of, uh, of innovation here, where you have in the Northeast, uh, in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, we are helped by uh, countries that are leaders in technology, anchored with the three continental economies. And in the South, we have ASEAN and Australia, which is rich in natural resources, and, and smack in the middle of that. Is, um, is Hong Kong and Singapore uh, providing financial services. Now, the, um, but in the past two years in particular, you've seen that there's a huge increase in, in IPOs. And in fact, in recent years, um, Hong Kong Stock Exchange even eclipsed the New York Stock Exchange as a center for raising capital for companies, thanks to China. Um, so what you see here um, is for Asia, ex-Japan, ex-Australia, uh, the financial centers of Hong Kong and Singapore's share of market capitalization in MSCI Asia, ex-Japan has dropped from 32% to 18% of the region. And the continental economies, uh, which were just 16% um, at the beginning of the decade, has now risen to close to 40% of the composition. Now, the country shares alone is not as significant as the next slide I'm about to show you. And that is, if, if we look at the, um, this is quite a busy slide, the first three countries are what I had labeled as technology countries. So Japan, Taiwan, Korea. Um, then you have Hong Kong and Singapore. And the next market here is the China A share market. Uh, China, uh, as defined in MSCI China, and uh, India and um, Indonesia. And uh, what is a clear distinction with mature and continental size markets is that they have a stock in every sector of the industry. If we look at the Singapore market, it has 
stocks represented in five out of the 10 industries in the MSCI sector classification. So the challenge that's frankly faced not just by Singapore, but also by Hong Kong, is that we are functioning in financial centers, unlike the US, UK, Europe, or Japan, where our domestic markets are not very rich in terms of the variety of industries that are present in them. So increasingly, uh, for example, if we look at our own business model where we have local um, uh, fund management companies or JVs in China, India, and Indonesia, we have Chinese, uh, we have more analysts on the ground in China, not just because they have um, uh, uh, more stocks, but because they have so many more industries and sub-industries that needs covering. So there is a natural, if you like, home base um, 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 I would, advantage, if you like, to having a continental-based economy as your home playing ground. Secondly, is that, um, and Gerard has alluded a bit to that just now, is that if we look at the fund flows from Hong Kong and Singapore, quite a bit of that is from foreign um, markets. I mean, they're from other pension funds in, in other countries or mutual fund flows from other countries. And what we have to recognize, and, and it's, it's clearly quite apparent when you sit in Hong Kong, is that the wealth is to the neighbor next door. So what's also very important, I think, in, in development of a fund management industry is if the financial center is sitting in a market where your domestic wealth base provides a very rich picking ground for indigenous growth. A lot of the global names that we see here were able to expand globally precisely because they have a large home base to grow from. In, um, and in most markets that they function in, their domestic market would be the largest share of the um, asset allocation in the client's portfolio. So that's one uh, clear advantage um, um, that they have. So I think those of us in Hong Kong and Singapore should recognize that we do not have the breadth of industries that you see in continental economies, nor do we have the uh, size of wealth markets um, <clears throat> that you find in, uh, in large continental economies. But as uh, Gerard said, uh, we do have, for example, in Singapore, uh, a leading private banking center. And those are some of the um, uh, areas where clearly um, uh, Singapore should take good advantage of. <coughs> Now, when one thinks of China, um, the, um, the, and perhaps not so much so in Singapore and Asia, but there's still, even in parts of Asia, an image that um, China is a producer of uh, cheap plastic toys and uh, generally of low value added products. And um, when there was talk about uh, China emerging as the second largest economy or about to take the, overtake the US, one of the questions I asked myself was that I don't think there was ever a time in history where a country had been the economic leader without concurrently being the innovation leader. It's hard to be the richest country, but not necessarily in innovation terms, the leader. And so one of the um, um, proxies that I'd use was to look at the development of, um, of economies through time by pattern registrations. And what you see here is that um, the US um, achieved industrial supremacy in the, um, in the early part of the last century. And then the Japanese miracle took off uh, from the 50s, and this is marked by the uh, red line for Japan. And these, these are just in terms of patent registrations. But what is a very encouraging sign is that from a short period from the mid 90s, the number of patents um, registrations in China 
has risen substantially. And in fact, if you now look at the top 20 companies in terms of the number of patents, you find um, in terms of distribution, one Chinese company here, that's Huawei Technologies, by the way. You have two Koreans, and uh, um, uh, in the lineup being Samsung and LG uh, Electronics. So what, what I think, therefore, is, um, is quite an interesting um, aspect of China's emergence in the region, both in terms of its share of market capitalization and its economy, but also its huge desire to climb up the innovation curve. And they are making inroads, as you can see, in making it, amongst others, into the top 20 in terms of the number of patent holders. Now, in terms of the stock market in China, um, it is, um, it's quite another interesting roller coaster ride, actually. And um, it started the decade at a PE of around 40 times. This is a China A share market, by the way. Then we all recall the phenomenal rise in, um, in the 07 period, above 40 times again. And now it's sub 10, uh, 15 times PE in the China A share market. Now, what is, an, so China, if you'd like, through the past decade, um, uh, with PE compression, and that's clearer in the next chart, where you see it in earnings growth is in the red. So China did achieve positive earnings growth through most of the decade last year. It's just in PE re-rating terms, it has actually, PE has compressed in every single year except for 2006 in China, and thereby leading to a market now that's trading around 10 times PE. So what's an interesting phenomenon with this is we now have, for um, those few rare occasions in Asia, that there is no unduly overvalued markets now in Asia. China, for a period, was claiming that position but we now have markets that are more um, uh, reasonably valued across. And, uh, and China had, in the past years as well, either been at the close to the very bottom or close to the very top of best performing markets in the world. And, and quite obviously, it was in the um, 06, 07 period where um, it captured the imagination of a lot of investors. And as a result, um, if we look at the correlation of China, it's one of the, um, of China A shares, it's one of the lowest um, um, across the, um, the other indices. So this is Shanghai A shares here, um, where pink shows a, a high correlation. And in, in terms of China A, you will see that it has um, a correlation of 50% or less with other countries except for uh, MSCI China, which, not surprisingly, it's correlated at 60%. So, and for a while, um, there was also the, uh, the story of why invest in China A, because you could buy China H, and, uh, and there was periods where it was trading at 100% a, a premium, if you'd like. And for, for a while, for a year, you could have bought China A shares at, um, as a basket for no premium over edge until recently, when um, more due to, I would say, the Hong Kong market falling more than the Chinese market has risen. So um, all in all, um, what we have is, a, um, is with the uh, roller coaster ride in China, a convergence of uh, valuations across the region um, that we now see at around the 10 plus kind of uh, uh, vicinity. So I'd like to uh, move, move on now. The, um, the only thing though is that while we look at our markets and we, we feel that valuations look uh, rather, uh, especially versus its history, um, uh, rather well priced. But if we look globally, so is the situation elsewhere. 
and um, you have a situation where uh, PEs around the world um, is also either at high single digits, 10 or low double digits. Now, the, um, the next topic I'd like to move to is uh, from capital gains to income. And um, I think that's, that's quite, quite important to highlight because um, the good thing about crises, if you like, is that um, it makes one sort of reflect back to basics. And uh, when one invests in equity markets, uh, uh, dividends were typically a non-event sort of, it, it came, it was a nice bonus, but I'm not, I'm not investing in equity markets for dividends. And the other challenge that we have faced post the financial crisis is, of course, the very low yield environment. And, um, and how does one go about investing in a low yield environment? The Japanese have probably the longest history in investing in low yield environments. And I would dare say that the Singaporeans also have a good history of investing in low yield environments. So do the Taiwanese and those in Hong Kong, actually. So we, we but the Japanese, I think, tops it all in terms of the length of uh, time that they have spent in a very low yield environment. So if one wants to think of how one should invest in a low yield environment, it might be worth taking a peep into what the Japanese do with their money. And what you see here is the Japanese mutual fund flow um, into the, um, if you like, the uh, top 10 categories. And looking at scale for minute, uh, um, these categories up here represent $118 billion in net flows. So the top category is high yield bonds, which attracted $35 billion in the past year. And basically, as you, what, what, what I also found encouraging, and uh, perhaps Gerard, um, you could also look to compete in that space, is in the bonds Asia Pacific, where they have now put $18 billion into, um, into uh, bonds in the region, which is a more recent phenomenon for the Japanese, by the way, because historically, like most Asians, we have typically thought of bond investments as investing in Western markets. We invest in Asian markets in equity, but we invest in Western markets for, for fixed income. But investing in Asian markets for fixed income, frankly, has been a, a phenomenon of more recent years, unless, of course, you're in an insurance company. But other than that, it has been uh, quite rare that you would have an Asian investor naturally thinking of Asia as a natural home for fixed income. So, um, and indeed, if we look at MSCI um, Asia X Japan over here, um, there, there is a, a, a few interesting uh, elements to highlight over here. First is that even though the past decade had, had, had been one where it was not short of, of crises, and we had SARS, for example, in that period, um, um, among some other global crises that we were hit with. Um, one of the things that we see is that it has been an upward trending market. And this, this has been a, um, uh, a phenomenon that's not something that we commonly see. In fact, if you look at the US market, the last 10 years has been a range trading market. But prior to this decade, for most of the past two decades prior to the millennium, the Western markets were trending markets. And Asian markets, and um, uh, notably markets like Korea, for example, were, were seen as quite range-bound markets. And not surprisingly, um, as a result, the, um, uh, it also resulted in different types of an investor behavior you had um, Asian investors who felt that market timing was much more important. Quite obviously, when you have a, uh, uh, a range trading market, it, it engenders that mindset. But, to, and two is, but on the other hand, you had advice that came, let's say, from global companies that said buy on dips. 
and when you have, and when you have an upward trending market, that made sense. So the other thing that also that is illustrated by um, this nice fear, and when Gerard was speaking, I, I sort of recalled um, and, and what was going on about how highly rated Singapore banks was, that there was um, an initiative or thought earlier on in the, in, in the decade, I think, where the question was, were Singapore banks or Asian banks overcapitalized? And there, there should be a, um, um, uh, a move or an initiative to try to extract a higher return on equity. And one of the good responses that you get from Asian corporates or financial institutions is that when you are battle-hardened, you tend to keep a bit more in reserves. And so one of the good things that we have and, um, is that, um, is that from, from Asia, we have had been quite battle-hardened in the, in the past two decades. And that has served us quite well in the current difficult environment that the world is, uh, is facing. So looking at the dissection, the, um, if we look at the um, total return index of the uh, MSCI, it can be explained by um, a few factors here. First is actually the PE has gone down by 12%. So if you'd like, the return that you see here of around 11, 12% annualized or 232% over the period has not been contributed by PE expansion. So if you hold that flat for a minute, um, currency contributed 36% uh, versus the dollar. These are local currencies versus the dollar. Dividends contributed 75%. So dividends actually contributed one-third of the returns that we, we got from investing in the Asian markets. And earnings contributed 132%. So in fact, the, um, the returns that we have seen uh, from Asia uh, can be almost totally explained by earnings, dividend, and currency, and not by just the fact that our markets have gotten more expensive. Quite on the contrary, our markets have gotten slightly cheaper in the, uh, in the past <coughs> decade. And um, the, um, the, um, the, the dividends, for example, um, it's one third here. But if you took a market at the depth of the crises, almost all of the uh, return at that point would be explained just by dividends alone. So one of the um, um, elements that we should not forget is that the dividends at a 5.1% volatility, so it's the lowest volatility return driver there. The, stock, the, the, the index itself has a volatility of 22%. Dividend return is 5%. So right now, notwithstanding generally a very upward sloping <coughs> index that you see here, one third of the returns is accounted by dividends. But because of its low volatility, at times of crises, the share of the total return made up by dividends is actually substantially larger. Now, the, um, the, one of the, the um, common conventional wisdom is that um, if you wanted to achieve high performance, you invested in high earnings uh, growth. And, uh, um, and if you wanted boring, safe stocks, you invested in dividend-paying shares. Now, this is an interesting piece of research done by Citi, which actually showed that um, it's not the highest quintile earnings per share uh, uh, stocks that delivered the highest return. It's actually those more in the third quintile. It may be related to the fact that much of that is factored in valuations. But the highest quintile of dividend paying stocks were actually delivering uh, the best performance. And if you look at the, 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 um, uh, the scale over here, this is 1,400 versus 
800 over here. And I, now besides, of course, the fact that um, um, if you think about it mathematically, when you have a 50% decline, you need a 100% sort of rebound to get back to its original level. The advantage that dividends uh, provide, obviously, is that um, um, with its lower volatility, it just chucks along and provides that, uh, that nice return. And the other thing I would think is that many people forget that, um, that um, um, and I think the other reason why it is successful is because it's a, it's a phenomenon that no, not many people buy into. It's not a crowded trade. <laughs> the highest EPS PE stock is a crowded trade. Now, um, I've just been flagged that I don't have much time left, so I'll try to zip through um, uh, the rest. The other phenomenon in, uh, in Asia is that we are dominated by equity and by bank lending. One of the things that was recognized by governments here is that corporate bonds form too small a percentage of their capital structures. And, and through time, there has been um, uh, efforts to raise that. We have seen more local currency um, um, issuance as well in, in, in the bond markets. 10 years has delivered around a similar return as the stock market in Asia with one quarter of its volatility. And, um, and we have in Asia the advantage that we have actually quite a rich picking of markets from triple A rated um, and investment grade over here um, to high yielders uh, on the right, which, um, which is gaining increasing attraction. So with corporate bonds gaining um, uh, increasing attention, and you can see here China really picking up over there, um, this is a yield curve of the RMB. And one is rewarded quite handsomely for going into corporate bonds. So you have 10 years here, around 4% in government uh, debt. And if you go to triple A rated corporates uh, in China, and these are sort of quasi sovereign names you could imagine, you get a pickup of close to 200 basis points. And of course, I should not, I'll just uh, mention obviously there's the internationalization of the RMB, first with Hong Kong, and now uh, Singapore is also joining um, uh, that race in terms of the. Uh, <coughs> the, um, the um, offshore RMB market. Now from products to solutions. Fortunately in Asia, partly because we are so used to crises, we are, in, we are entering this crisis with actually a lot of cash. <laughs> and uh, um, it's, it's more the uh, sort of Anglo-Saxon influence markets where we see 40% invested in equities but except for, let's say, Australia, Hong Kong, and to an extent, Singapore, uh, a lot of the wealth, um, there's, there's a low holding of equities, and there's a high percentage of uh, cash throughout. Now, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that <clears throat> I, constant, I see here sometimes from clients, and I think it probably has great resonance with all of you, is that the definition, what is the definition of a global, a global portfolio? Now the conventional definition of a global portfolio is that it will be invested everywhere for diversification. Now typically, an Asian investor would think of it quite differently. And there's a key difference in the words used here, I think. The, the conventional definition is everywhere, the Asian definition is anywhere. We want to be invested anywhere in the world where you are bullish. <laughs> One of the great difficulties that clients have is why are you in a market at such a weighting when you know that it's not bullish? Just because the uh, asset allocation calls for such a weighting um, so I think actually there is room um, to, to revisit how asset allocation is done. And when you sit in a market where 
private banking is a leading sector of, um, uh, in Asia. Products is secondary. You know, the funny thing is, and coming back to academics for a minute, no? when we went to school, we'll be told that asset allocation is about 80% of returns. When we go out to the real life, it's quite a different matter. If you look at most houses, what percent of their staff is in asset allocation versus what percent of their staff is in bottom-up stock selection, which the academics argue has actually the lowest impact on the portfolio return. Now, there are arguments for that, that it's easier to make decisions when, the, when you have the benefit of the law of large numbers. But in today's world, asset allocation does not necessarily just need to mean bonds and equities. And some of the products that have come out of that is, for example, this is an example of a dynamic asset allocation product. And basically, if I have to sum it up in one line, the investment philosophy of the product is invest only if you're bullish. If you're not bullish, go to cash. I, th I think that has a lot of resonance in particular with those who are in the private banking field, but I would also argue that in the institutional field, when you're there to fund liabilities, your liabilities are listed, are, are, are in real terms. <laughs> They're not relative to a certain benchmark that might be negative. And um, so there's now an, um, um, in a rebirth of the global balance type of managers, known more as diversified growth managers, and here's a sample of them. And in Asia, you can quite see there's a huge disparity between those active in Asian equity bonds and in Asia balance. There's, there's also uh, some work, and this is done by Mercer here, on how returns after 20 years or 10 years um, differ depending on the beginning PE. Now, some of you may have functioned in markets where, uh, or with clients where you're, where you're told that if, you have, um, if your asset allocation is, let's say, 60 bonds and uh, 40 equities, and the client gives you some money, you, you should quickly get to that level, <laughs> get to fully invested soon. And I, I think at times our measurement tool has dictated what we should do rather than necessarily what best serves our client needs. And if you look at how the returns vary depending on the entry point, you would then say that the asset allocation should be quite skewed depending on what valuation levels are at the point of entry and not just the fact that if you are 60, 40 client, irrespective of whether we are in 2007 or, or right now, you should have the same allocation. And, and this is, I thought, also quite an interesting chart that shows the um, evaluation metric uh, between emerging markets and developed markets. And you could see that in 98, emerging markets were very cheap relative to developed markets. The gap has since narrowed to about parity. And if you <clears throat> then cross-reference that to the same point in 98, emerging markets have outperformed by four times. The challenge, though, is that we are now valued similarly to developed markets. And um, so let me um, uh, end with something um, uh, that, that, that clearly Singapore should is an early adopter on, and that's risk-based capital. You know, I, I'm a believer that we, we should fight battles where we have a natural advantage or leadership. And if you, if, if you have the center of private banking resident in Singapore, and, and making clients rich is a key imperative for that, for that group, then products is frankly widely available. As it's the allocation and the advice that's valuable. Products can be bought quite readily. And in the insurance sector, Singapore has been uh, a leader in, in the adoption of risk-based capital. And as it gets implemented elsewhere, it's, it's probably also something that Singapore could, could export 
in terms of its experience uh, in, in how it does this. So in, in summary, <clears throat> I, I guess the three key points is that um, over the past decade, the rise of the continental economies, I think, has been the most significant factor, in particular the rise of, uh, of China. Um, so we, we should actually welcome the fact that our, our um, um, Asian equity base is now more balanced across industries and countries, even though that's to the expense of financial centers like ourselves. Um, and two is a respect for, for income over just raw capital gains. And three is that um, it's the advice and asset allocation, especially in markets where um, you, you're, you're sitting at, uh, at the heart of a private banking center where your clients, frankly, just want to pursue absolute returns. That uh, should be the area of uh, development and focus. Thank you very much.